Revelation of the virtual reality game, somebody figuring out that they're in a three sun environment. Um, that was a fun moment. The visual of the hijacked tanker getting carved up by nanotech was kind of fun. Um, but there's just a disconnect. Like it might as well be a book from an alien civilization in, as in terms of relatability to any of the decisions that anybody makes. Well, yeah, I, can we, can we, can we, uh, I think Bryce yeah. is trying to oh, get us. Oh yeah, on the no, we're live, we're on. Uh, this we is on? not okay. sensitive, right. so, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that like, I, early on, I, you know, you could, you could figure out what was going on for the most part, and you kind of wait for the conflict to happen, and then you get to the very end where this is our goal, and it's a small sort of goal, kind of relative to the grand scheme of things, and then it ends, and you're like, oh, this is a part of a much bigger story, and I didn't get, like, you're uh, that super inspired. It, I think there is something to the promise that there's a 400-year atomic bomb headed your way, you know? Oh, no, sure. And, I, and, sure. I, and the idea that entire generations are going to grow up defeatist, um, uh, th there's something there. But, I mean, look, I, I, I'm, st I'm stalled out halfway through the second book. There's, there's stuff that I just, I'm just like, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Oh, hey, a new nonfiction. Yeah, I, I, I think it was filled with great ideas. I think the writing is wonderful. I think, I think the, like the, but I just, the plot wise, I'm like, I got to the end of it. I'm like, this is, this is the prelude. Like, I felt like if this was, a, you know, Peter of Hamilton novel that I would still get two thirds more of a novel or, or more. And it, it does, I, it, it, it does feel similar in scope to a Peter F. Hamilton novel, which I really dug, but, but lacking the, the relatable humanity that a Peter mm -hmm. F. Hamilton novel has. Yeah, and you know what made the most sense for me is I read the Wikipedia, and you find out that it was originally a serialized story. It wasn't originally? It, wasn't, it was it started off as a serialized serial. Got it. And I'm like, ah, I get it. So this was like something where we're getting bits at a time, whatever, and then you get, and I'm like, and then I, I don't know if it went all the way through the Dark Forest, but I just got to the end of this, I'm like, I'm done. I'm, um, I get why people dig it, yeah. but it's not for me, so. Uh, hey, uh, oh, I'm going to see if something's possible while Bryce is gone. <laughs> the laws of physics don't work when Bryce is yeah. gone. So I started watching The Good Place. Ooh, what do you think? Uh, I really dig it. Roshni, what do you think? She goes, hmm. Um, I, I dig it because you looking at the evolution of Michael Schur as a showrunner, you know, from... Office, unlikable character, we'll make him likable second season and onward to Parks and Rec. We'll start off a likable character, we'll make her dumb. Okay, can't make her dumb, got to make her smart. And not. And they way improved, you know, Leslie Knope's character in, in Parks and Rec, in my opinion. And here, uh, focusing on the idea of going from bad to worse sort of seems, seems like an interesting thing he's had a lot of experience with. And I like the shift because uh, I'm like, oh, this is really smart because – you watch the first episode like, all right, I know this isn't what everybody thinks it is. There's going to be a change up and that's going to be cool. And we'll find out the reveals. And I thought they were delightful. And then, you know, the second season and what they try to do there. So uh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, it's a show that's kind of always ahead of you, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, and it's really just it, it, it's so great to see such an expansive kind of comedy like to do yeah. what is effectively a workplace comedy but like have the workplace be like all of time and space and possible realities and heaven and hell. Yeah. We're almost done with the second season. So are we just, yeah, our first yeah. Episode? yeah, we, we have not watched episode one yet. Episode one's really good. Hmm. I'm excited. We'll, we'll be discussing yeah. that on cord killers. Oh, the only, wow. Whoa. the only mm -hmm. I was able to get into from last night or this week with TwitchCon was, uh, Succession. Succession. Oh, you didn't even watch Gemstones, huh? Oh, to the G. A N. Oh. He's playing in. Literally, literally, we we uh, we, I got on the plane and we were like trying to watch it on the plane, but the Wi-Fi wouldn't hold me up. And like as we're taking off, I just get Bryce saying Succession. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! All right, well I got to make sure that I watch it now, but I have not seen uh, I have not seen Gemstones yet. The Gemstones this week is also really good. Two really strong episodes of those shows this week. Uh, I, I very much appreciated your 
uh, Bryce, that uh, Gemstones and Succession are both better than Game of Thrones because I know all of the characters. <laughs> <laughs> Every that I'm always I'm never sure. I'm never ever sure who is who on Game of Thrones. So uh, it's because you're racist. You can't tell the difference between all them white people. That's right. They all look well, the same to you. Don't, they do. Doesn't I don't care about history. <laughs> I, exactly. Know your history, Bryce. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely like appreciate. I, I just do, I do think that it's an underrated yet probably widely held take that like, hey, I enjoyed Game of Thrones because everybody else was into it and I liked being a part of a conversation, but I have no idea who any of these people are and I always need to talk to somebody else to understand what the hell happened or else what's like, a skewed view. That was what I liked about rewatching it was because like, Ah, I know that guy's name now. <laughs> you know, I know. Now that conversation before, I kind of got the context of, but I wasn't quite sure. Now I know exactly what that was about, you know. Yeah, you rewatched the pilot, and you're like, oh, wow, there was a ton of stuff in there. Look at that. They, it wasn't just a bunch of, like, you know, medieval skullduggery. Yeah, exactly. Justin, were you plan. sent one of these? I was, I, no. A little tankard? Yeah. It, it just said no, awesome. sp no spilling in the studio from one Katie Dirks. Oh, my God. That's so I good. It. Very nice. Thank you, Katie. I thought that was sweet. I haven't had to make a no food or drinks in here rule yet, but <laughs> we, we did have, what was it, a salami? We had a salami issue last week. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt <laughs> just, just wolfing down some pastrami. And I'm like, are these, uh, this looks like uh, pieces bug? of an animal around here? Right, because we have bugs and roadkill around here. <laughs> well, the funniest part was when Matt walked over to help us inspect, and then uh, finally it was like, Oh, that might be the pastrami that I was eating before. <laughs> uh, so real quick before we start, I put out a survey because I want to, you know, kind of just get a fresh eyes on the politics stuff as we get into this big, important season. Right. And uh, one of the things I wrote was like, hey, if I, if I brought on like regular guest hosts, like which are the people that I've had or just totally out of left field, who would you like? And there were a bunch for Heaton, but one of them was just... Uh, I, I'm not a, I don't consider myself a horse guy, quote unquote, but I find myself addicted to his horse universe, <laughs> <laughs> which I just thought was great. All right. All right. I'm good to go whenever show? you guys are. Yeah. yeah. All right. I got that bit of cereal up in my upper gum. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. It Tragic. No, I'm just going to. Breaking like, news on the Weird Things hey. podcast. <laughs> I'm going to use my mouthwash. Oh, wait, I didn't update that. Right, go. Car pranks. Car pranks. <laughs> car pranks. Oh, I'm just playing car pranks. <laughs> How about last step, the week before, the kid that played uh, McBride's character? Oh, it was amazing. That was just, I'm like, where did they find this kid? This kid I mean, is he, like... Him and, and the kid who played young Jack Black in the Tenacious D movie, like, casting from heaven. Yeah. Oh, you don't see the monitor out, or do you? Uh, I, I oh, see yeah, yeah. the program out. Okay, yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right, well, if we're going to start the show, then let's start the show in three, two... Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. <laughs> Brian Brushwood. Yo-ho, second week from the new studio. I can't believe it. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody, that's me. Well, well, well. What a weekend it was if you're a fan of things that are awesome. Yeah, well, for example, uh, I, I got know. my... <laughs> Magic Spoon cereal that you recommended last week on the podcast. I look forward yep. to having some cereal. Uh, yep. I, I, I watched, uh, I watched uh, The Good Place came out. Uh, I watched that. I went, to, I went to TwitchCon. I met so many cool people. Bryce? I did a lot of work. Ooh, yeah, That's no, great. so, so, so got you got a lot done. of uh, fulfillment out of, out of doing I, something that matters. We got work done. I, I got to, you know, this is what I love about the show is my friends, sometimes we fight each other over picks, you know, we want to get it in before the other guy. Here, 
these guys are letting me save the biggest news, even though they're bursting to tell you about it. I mean, I don't think anything else happened. I mean, Righteous Gemstones was good last night. There was the last episode of Preacher. That was fun. They know they want to share it, but I'm going to be the one to share it. SpaceX revealed the Starship. Oh! Go to SpaceX.com right now, and you're going to see something really cool. When the upper tab, they list their fleet. You know, they got a fleet of different craft. Um, and they now have a tab for Starship. And they did, Elon Musk did the reveal on Saturday. They did this from Texas, Boca Chica. And we're looking at video of this right now. And they had drone shots of this, whatever. He unveiled the plan, said, hey, this is this is Mark 1. And, man, the design's gone through a lot of changes, but this looks like the, the form they're going to try to go with. And what he unveiled was the prototype. And this is actually designed to go up to about... Uh, 20 kilometers, 65,000 feet. It has three engines in it, three after engines. Elon thinks in a month or two, they're actually going to send this thing up. Won't go to space, but it's going to go test. This is going to test the maneuver for this thing to come back to Earth. It's a different way than they have brought their first stage boosters back. This has these four aerodynamic surfaces that are going to let it sort of fall like a skydiver and sort of just basically adjust very, very quickly and then come back to Earth and then land. This is the rocket that's basically planning, you know, the plans are for this system to be what we go to Mars, the moon. Even they showed uh, images of this thing going to Saturn. Look, we will talk about all the amazing, cool things about it. But some part of my brain can't let go of the fact that if, if somebody told me this is the spaceship of the future, I would I would <laughs> laugh at them because it's the most cartoonishly obvious Buck Rogers design f- right yeah. from the fact that, you know, because it's a prototype, uh, all of the stainless steel is a little bit kind of warped. So it looks a little bit like a science <laughs> project wrapped in tinfoil and to the way that it takes off and lands like it's a 1930s Buck Rogers yeah. model, like everything about this. I can't believe like we're not only living in the future, we're living in the most obviously ripped off from a hundred years ago version of the future (laughs) this this one which for the prototyping they're not using the 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 more advanced methods they're going to use to weld the steel and all that if you told me that this was oh that's a farmer who loves science fiction that's his grain silo yes yes (laughs) i'd be like yeah no that's a rocket i don't know (laughs) so if you look at this thing as brian points out you see like this steel is like basically this is this version is not designed to go into space. They're gonna they're starting building in a month or two the versions. They're gonna be building a lot of versions of this because they did a big shift. We talked a lot about how originally they were gonna use carbon fiber composite materials, and you know then we heard about like tanks, possible carbon fiber tanks exploding, and then the scale of stuff. A year ago, only a year ago, they said, you know what? They looked. There's a type of steel which is very good with high temperatures. It is really strong at low temperatures, which meant that it was actually going to be an ideal material to build your spaceship spaceship out of. Because a big part of what you have to do is you have to keep these cryogenically cooled fuels inside of there, and certain materials become very brittle. So they found a steel that was about 2% the cost of carbon fiber, and they said, well, let's shift to this. makes more sense. We have these really next cool next-generation heat tiles. They're going to use those. So they shifted that production, and part of the advantage of using steel is we know tons about welding steel, how to make steel, and all that. And then Elon, during his, I really recommend you guys get a chance check out when he does the uh, the announcement because you know they're they're somebody uh, I forget like a reporter from uh, CBS or somebody is like, hey, so uh, because they're in this Boca Chica facility where they're standing next to like two prefabbed, two prefab. I mean, I don't mean like. I mean, these are not, these are like, like party rental tents almost kind of thing. They're, you know, these, they're not, they're, you know, structures you use, but they're not like full on aluminum sided stuff or whatever. This is no seven. It's a, it's, let's say okay. it's, it's a, I don't even want to say a full step up from what you saw at the fire festival. I mean, they're very temporary yeah. structures. Yeah. And then, so the guy goes, oh, is this going to be a little more developed? Yeah. And Elon's like, oh yeah. And he's, but he's like, listen, said, we realized it would take too long to build the buildings, so we just started building the rockets. 
I, and, and weirdly, that makes sense. Uh, also, to convey what the ro rocket remi reminds me of visually is if you saw the movie The Aviator about uh, uh, Howard Hughes, there's uh, some prototype ship that he or airplane that he's trying to fly. And uh, there's a version that is almost right, but then he realizes that all of the rivets on it are mm -hmm. screwing up the aerodynamics. And so it's like, you could tell it's the same plane afterwards, but then he you know, has all the rivets kind of, kind of ground down and smoothed out. This is the, the riveted version where you're like, From yeah, it's kind of there. That was exactly the reference I was thinking about in my head looking at this, was that really? scene in The Aviator where he looks along the rivets and stuff. So yes. Um, and so what they're going to do is in the demo... You'll see actually from the airborne aerial style, you'll see there's a big cylinder on the ground. And so what the next step is they're gonna get the much larger spooled steel, pull it off of the spool, and just use one weld per ring and do that. And they have, remember we saw at the factory this friction stir welders? We saw the amazing welding machines they can. So the Sorry, next I, generation I, 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 yeah, yeah, that's a that's a term that I'm not uh, accessing right now. Friction stir welders. So what a friction stir welder is, is you take you take two pieces of metal and then you have like a little a, like a tungsten tip or something go back and forth on it really fast and create fixed friction, which then melds the alloys together. It's how they weld the uh, SpaceX stuff together. They use them for some, I believe, some of the parts in the Tesla. And so it gives you a much better weld, a much higher precision weld between two materials. Got it. So um, they have all the, you know, the, you know, all these great techniques that they'll be using to do it. And the plan is this version is designed just to test, you know, their flap system, the aerodynamics and the landing of the engine. So it'll go up to that. They have one they're building, the Mark II, uh, which they're building in Florida. That'll do that. Then the Mark III, which they're building this thing simultaneously, you know, are going to be starting them. They're going to be, that'll be the one that'll probably go orbital. You know, Elon says they think they're going orbital next year. And Next possibly year. even crew, even crew. Somebody said, "What up, crew?" He says, "We did." You know, Elon has been very, very happy with the price. You know, he says switching to steel. He says switching to steel was perhaps. He says it's the best design decision he's ever made in his life, and it's just accelerated things tremendously. All right, but on a scale from one to the 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 the, the timeline has been elongated. Uh, where is this is going to go orbital next year on Elon Musk's? Yeah, yeah time. let's let's step outside of the Elon Musk filter and instead let's do the mm -hmm. sensible podcast host filter. <laughs> well, I mean, no, no, this is no, this is like knowing him. Like he always overstates his timelines, and I, I think he believes them at the point that he says them. But he also is somebody that has a, you know, he's he's realistic in that if something goes up and it goes wrong, then it sets his company back, a, a, you know, a year and a half. He, he he describes his time frames as aspirational. Ideally, this is the way these things would go. I would say that he has gotten better. And and we looked at, they were, it was a year ago, they said carbon fiber. And here we are a year later, and it's shifted. But now there's, we've already watched the Starhopper. Starhopper's taken off and landed. We've seen that happen this year. We've now looking at what we assume to be, and I think they, I think they threw a lot of the parts in there and just bolted them in to say, "Hey, look what we're done," and they're going to take them apart again, and then before they do their tests and stuff. But yes, his his timelines are bad, and and I think that I would be surprised if they happen in the time frame that he said. But I think his timelines have gotten better. Yeah, and and even then, you could do worse than on your entrepreneur report card have pretty much one black mark on and that's deadlines like you still turned it in eh, just a yeah. bit after schedule although well, uh, you know, turned, uh, I mean, yeah, if it were possible yeah i mean and also it's like he's not doing i mean i guess with tesla he's doing a, a consumer facing item but like for, for spacex specifically he's uh, it, it matters that you get it right more than you get it on time i i gotta send a photo to you which was kind of hilarious because like he was doing an interview with cnn and i'll to <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it, because they asked him about, there was a little bit of a, a he got a little pushback because Jim Bridenstine, head of, Na head of NASA, tweeted out the day before, like, looking forward to SpaceX's, you know, announcement. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish that the same enthusiasm was, fa you know, we, we had the same enthusiasm from our commercial crew partners, which is the, the manned spacecraft, you know, project. And it didn't say specifically SpaceX in that part of the sentence or that part of the parent tweet, but it certainly seemed like he was throwing a little bit of shade at SpaceX for being like, hey, this is great. You're building this, but where's NASA's crew capsule, you know? Yeah. And 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Elon says, yeah, did he say that he's disappointed in SLS or crew? And then Elon just turns to the camera and made that face. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> just a full-on mugging like, uh, did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, any event, I, it's, it's, it's exciting. If you go over to the, the page and you take a look at the specs on Starship, uh, this is a beast. This thing's going to be taller than Saturn V. Uh, they're hoping to be able to launch from these from both Boca Chica, which is going to be their own spaceport, and Canaveral. And the, you know, this is going to have, you know, this is what they want to transition everything to. They instead of doing Falcon Nines, they just want to use this. The capability for the amount of tonnage this could put into space is insane. The payload capacity of this is basically, you know, one international space station. Um, Hey, you know, I, the interior. I, I, I got a question. The um, Starship, as we saw it alone, we know we're going to see a test flight where it'll go up however many miles and then come back down. But um, uh, we also talked about how Starship just by itself, uh, you can't put anything in it, but you could get one up to orbit. Um, but is, is that enough that without a booster, a Starship could be that 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 15 minute journey to Japan that we've talked about? Um, Suborbital possibly, because they asked him about it certainly could go some distance suborbital, but uh, to do the Japan journey, I think you're going to want the booster because you you want to go into space to do that. They asked him about, oh, could this do could this do single stage to orbit? And he, you know, and Elon, my answer was like, well, no. And then he starts the spreadsheet that he looks at in his head. He's like, well, you know, if we did this, we could, but then it'd be up there to have no fuel, and it really wouldn't be worth it. And his and his mind too is like. The boosters are the most reliable thing they've done so far. Getting boosters back to Earth or something they've 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 broken a few and they've learned a lot about doing that. And in his mind, it's like, why not just use a booster and get the whole thing back anyways? Because you could put it into orbit. When we talked about this before, like you could you you know the, the value of scoring points or not scoring points, you could get into orbit. But if you want to get it down, you still have to refuel it, which then means using a booster and another starship right well and plus also when you reliably are able to recover all of your boosters and reuse them suddenly that becomes a you know or we could add three percent to the budget of this thing and use a booster and it's like okay yep he he talked they talk about the presentation too he's thinking on because they talk about like the reusability rate he's like well you know we'd be able to reuse the booster like 20 times a day you know, and then he's like the starship, you know, he gets it's funny because you watch him, you watch him all of a sudden, it's like he forgets who his audience is. And he's like, well, starship, you'd only be able to use like maybe six times a day, because, you know, if you think about an orbit, you know, unless it's a polar orbit or, you know, it, or else it's an equatorial orbit, it's a geostationary orbit. It's actually a sine wave, which just means to catch up to that orbital pattern. You know, you're like, OK, we get it. We can't can't use you have it takes four hours to get to where you need to go and then come back okay cool you know but uh it's his he's thinking about building fleets fleets of these i really adore the fact that um you know what one of the things when somebody's a new media creator and maybe this is more of an after things topic but i talk a lot about like what is it people are really buying what is it that really matters like when you're at the point where you realize what people really want is rockets all of a sudden, a bunch of obvious things like there should be buildings for our employees. Then it's it's the crazy people who say, I don't know, should there? Seems to me like we want to make rockets. <laughs> and, and is building yeah. a building absolutely necessary to build a rocket? I'm not sure about that. And, and, and I'm sure a lot of people on the outside are going to go nuts over that kind of decision. But I love, you know, pass or fail that people are at least, you know, taking that jump. There's there's certainly a book to be written about the evolution of Elon Musk, where you know the things that were pivotal towards him. When the Model S came out, it was a huge success. It was the thing they said they couldn't do, and they pulled it off. And they in their their first time out making a car, mass scale car, luxury car, won tons of awards and accolades, and it was just this blew people away. So Elon then is like, I'm gonna go up this. I'm gonna build the Model X with gold wing doors and wait and see what we're gonna do now. He introduced several layers of complexity, and that was that was problematic. The Model X early ones had a lot of problems, and he talks about like how they were just too ambitious. And a lot of people like me, I look at it like I, I don't see the difference, but I appreciate when they say that internally the things they tried to do made things so much more complicated, and that was a big problem. And I think that he learned from that. 
He talked twice. He said, well, my new motto is uh, if the schedule is too long, it's wrong. If it's tight, it's right. <laughs> and so that's what he said. When we come up with these plans, if it seems like it's going to take too long to do it, he's like, that's wrong. And I think that was, in, you know, the idea of like, well, hey, we could weld this outside and build our airframe to get this thing tested. And he's like, yes, you know, that, and so that is sort of a, a bit of the Apple aesthetic as well or the the apple direction like uh take um take the fact that only now are we getting a version of an apple watch that actually displays the time all day long or at least 18 hours of the day uh like they knew to just say no where it's like yeah uh we know everybody would love a watch that's on all the time all day and able to track all that stuff uh we could get there eventually but although i say that but then meanwhile apple tv has taken over a decade and is only just now getting around to some kind of official uh launch so in that regard apple's being very unapple but but yeah i think there's a value to ship with what you have and then figure the rest out yeah and there's also you know a lot there's a bigger discussion too about how there's companies and then there are projects and you you know the priority of a company by which talent they throw at something you know and sometimes they like yeah we'll keep x number of people working on things like apple tv but like I remember the Apple TV was, I got disappointed when Apple went on there and they had somebody talk about for five minutes about the screensavers. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, this is a bit of an underdeveloped project. But then uh, you have other things happen, which we could talk about the, the, the Oculus announcements too, where you go, man, this sucks. Then you find out why something sucks. It's because they moved the entire team to a different division that's got something better, but they didn't tell you. And you're like, why does this suck? But if you if you go down to the bottom of the SpaceX.com slash Starship page, you can see some of the examples of the overview, and they show you uh, the different uses for it. And there was some stuff that wasn't in the presentation. They show, like, uh, launching satellites, and they show, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the payload they show coming out of there, I think that's, like, the James Webb or one of our space, one of the NASA space telescopes. But they're wow. showing this massive, you know, payload coming. So they have they're going to build because they've lowered the cost of building these things because of the stainless going to the stainless steel. That has a big impact, and it means that if you're if you could build it, if it's you know costs you thirty percent as much or whatever, your engines still are the big limiting factor. By the way, is going to be producing engines because the booster itself will have like forty three <laughs> engines. Wow. Um, but you know, but then again, it's like we watched the Falcon Heavy take off now twenty seven, and that was the big question: Can this many engines work? We've never had this many engines fire. Now the Falcon Heavy's done that reliably, a couple times. But uh, you look at we're seeing one version of this has this sort of chomper mode, so this would be different than the the passenger one. So the idea is, you would drive out there and you would see a fleet of these with you know some are designed to carry satellites, some are designed to carry fuel, some are designed to carry people, some are going to be Elon's private party palace. <laughs> um, you know, and so it's neat to go look there and see the different missions, the different capabilities they show. They show that look at the one where it locks, docks next to the space station. Um, and you realize like, uh, what, what's docking with what? This is really huge. Yeah, um, dude. Uh, by volume, it looks like it's uh, roughly the size of the space station. It, I, yeah, it actually, it's probably, <laughs> it actually has probably the same interior volume. So, um, there you go. That's the Starship. I highly recommend checking out the presentations. I know we, I say that a lot, but I do think that, you know, if you were to look back, it, you know, when when people passed protocols for like, you know, worldwide web traffic or, you know, Tim Berners-Lee's like, hey, I've got a different way to display documents on the Internet. You're like, whatever, nerd, <laughs> you know, and then 20 years later, it's an indispensable part of our life. And sometimes it's hard to think, well, how would space be this? Because I don't want to go to space. It's not so much just the idea of going there. It's the commercial activity. It's the technology. It's the materials technology. It's the science. It's this other, this big other factor that, you know, plays into like, I'm not a geologist, but geology plays a very important role in my life from, you know, all sorts of things. So exciting. And so just the time, let me go through the timelines again. Next month to two months, they hope to do the test, the Mark I, the one we saw. That's the goal is to do that. Six months to a year, they want to go orbital and so and possibly even have crew, which again, we timelines. But that is the plan is that, you know, next year, next year, we should see this thing go into space, maybe. And then we'll see from there how this this changes everything, too, because 
NASA's NASA's watching this. Half of NASA is worried because they're involved in programs involving the SLS, et cetera, which is still moving along. And half of everybody else is like, we're tired of waiting. We want something really cool now. If we have this capability, this is a, this is a big game changer. And you know what is what is the world like when you could do a space startup? You know when you could realistically kickstart an experiment to send you and your friends up into space to do some chemistry experiment or some fab thing or whatever. You know what is what is the world like when you know we could kickstart our own satellites and other stuff or you know, well, I got bad that... news for you, Andrew. You don't need to go to space to change the world. We've already got what? people changing the world right now. Yeah, patreon.com slash weird things is where you go to support this show. That's what you do. Type it into your keyboard and then hit return because this is the adventure of a lifetime. Oh, my gosh. Imagine the fun. smug satisfaction that you're going to have walking down the street, feeling like you're 20 feet tall, giving the middle finger to Elon Musk. I don't see Elon Musk as one of our patrons at patreon.com slash weird things. He's not keeping us loud, live and independent. No, he's over there building rockets. So, I mean, basically six of one, half dozen of the other. When you become a patron at patreon.com slash weird things. Yeah, in fact, I'll bet he's some kind of sucker that listens to two separate RSS feeds. One for after things, one for weird things. Not one of the cool people who gets it all in one feed and gets stuff early. So know that you get access to after things before Elon Musk. Take that, Elon. Dude. You know what? I'm going to add to this offer. When we build our spaceship, Starship, Free rides for all listeners. You have a guarantee when we build ours, free rides for everybody. Yeah, true Absolutely. fact. I don't oh, what's that, Elon? You say that's not cost effective? Oh, take it to your shareholders. Why don't you commiserate with Starman over that? We love our audience more than you do, apparently. Yeah. Spike the football on Elon Musk's face. Go to <laughs> patreon.com slash weird things right now. I love science, but sometimes I feel like the job of a scientist is to stay up late at night and go, how can I s terrify people? <laughs> nope, that yeah. was Michael Crichton's job, but very close. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I want to scare people. How may I scare them today? And uh, remember when we talked about Planet Nine, the idea that way out in the outer edge of the solar system, there may be a massive body, which is basically slightly changing the orbital path of things like in the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt, like, like where I think uh, the Oort clouds were seeing these, these, these things seem to be feeling looking, looking like they're being pulled by some sort of attractive mass out there. There's something there, maybe, you know, something that could be like a Neptune sized mass, you know, another planet, maybe that's way out there. That's hard to see. Cause we don't know specifically where it is. And it's like trying to find, you know, flecks of dust without knowing where to look. Right. Um, which is cool, and there's some arguments that are like, oh, well, maybe it's just something else, you know, maybe something passed through. Like, we don't know what it is. We haven't seen conclusively any evidence of a planet there. Could be, but it's just really hard to find, and that'd be kind of cool if we do. But somebody else has said, hey, we got a theory for you. What if it's not a planet? I was oh. wondering about this. Like, what if it's like a, just a collection of, uh, but, but if it was a cloud of big asteroids or gas giants you would think that it would spread out into a ring around the whole the whole solar system but so what if it's up what if it's something else that's able to hold its structure brian oh like an alien craft it could be like no, an alien no. megastructure just hanging out watching us what show do you think this is <laughs> sorry i didn't mean to go to what, stray outside what, of the sensible what, solutions what frame of reference do you think i was inside my head that i didn't share with anybody <laughs> Um, no, uh, maybe, um, but no, no, I got better, better. That? What, what is that? Tiny black hole. Now, okay. I, I hear a lot of things like, about. I was all aboard my alien spaceship idea, <laughs> but no. I, I hear stuff about black holes that reminds me that I know very little about black holes. Uh, I think of black holes as, you know, uh, super dense, you know, you got a Jupiter collapse down or whatever. But then I also hear about tiny black holes evaporating, which sounds crazy to me. The idea that tiny black holes exist and then break apart and wisp away. Uh, and, 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 and then I hear that, oh, we don't have to worry about faraway black holes swallowing our planet because 
their gravity well is very specific and doesn't really affect us. I mean, outside of like the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, like, what am I not understanding about black holes? Well, Brian, I don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, um, I, I know that uh, it's almost like there's a branch of physics where people ask that question every day. I, I was just you hoping know, that maybe not... you knew a couple of little bits. Uh, well, that, that... You, you, you have, you can have things at different scale and you do get like, they, they found out that like you have edges of it, like, you have radiation that's given off like that was like Hawking, I think, got the Nobel Prize for that. So they can part of it can radiate away and they can sort of evaporate through that process. But you can have different sizes of this when these things start to condense and get small. And the idea is that you say, ah, like, like, oh, it's going to suck in everything. Like, well, if it has Earth sized gravity, then it's an Earth sized threat to that. And only th bodies that get really, really close to it really have to worry about that, you know. And that's the thing we tend to think of is it's sort of like, Ah, oh, this thing is, you know, it's going to suck in the universe. Well, the, no more than the sun is, you know, whatever the, an equivalent mass It's will only going to soak up, uh, suck up its neighborhood of the universe, its section. So, <laughs> like, when we talk about the heat death of the universe, right, I, I assume that the heat death of the universe looks like all mass has been sucked into some black hole. So, so all that's left of reality is a bunch of Swiss cheese black holes. Is that correct? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, my understanding is different and, and not confident enough to say. Okay, neither of us know anything. All right. Yeah. So, but, but as far as uh, um, the, the, the idea of black holes, like you could have a, you could have a, you could take, you could take the matter in your fist and it could become a black hole. It would be an extremely super, 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 super small black hole and not really pose much of a threat to anything. You know, it would just, you know, fall through the center of the earth and just sort of sit there. You know, we, we think of a, the black hole's power is related to how much mass or how much, you know, the mass is there. So a black hole that's, you know, weighs this, you know, this, the side, the mass of our sun is going to have the gravitational attraction of our sun. Our sun. Yeah. So you in know. other words, like imagine, um, imagine all the planets are orbiting the sun. Suddenly you, you get a telegram because it's the 1800s that says this just in uh, sun now the size of a golf ball. And you're like, what's changed? And then it says nothing. Stop. And then it says, yeah, uh, uh, please burn more coal. <laughs> yeah, it'll, yeah, it's going to get cold. But yeah, exactly. So, and that's, we're paraphrasing, but that's basically the idea is that it's whatever the mass of it is, that's, it doesn't increase its gravitational attraction, you know, and so it's just the same thing, but it's a much smaller, denser thing. And that's what makes it scary because, you know, you do have super massive black holes, which if, you know, the mass of a thousand suns, and that's pretty intense. So the idea here is that you have something that's maybe, a Neptune sized, a Neptune, not Neptune sized, but a thing with a mass of Neptune, but you know, size of, size of a bowling ball or whatever that's out there that's this attractive thing. So, uh, again, it's, you know, the, 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 it's a theoretical paper. It's not necessarily put out there as this is what we think it is, but it's like, let's entertain the idea that there is a black hole at the outer edge of our solar system. If there can be small black holes, do you think it's possible that black holes? that antimatter is like very small black holes? Well, uh, I, is so, that, is that anything? Uh, what, uh, antimatter specifically, uh, uh, yeah, if that were true, you would see annihilations all the time as, um, because whenever matter connects with antimatter, there's, there's an annihilation and a release of massive amounts of energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, now in theory, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, if there's entire galaxies made of antimatter, then there would be antimatter black holes, but they would be very, very far away. Well, uh, Think of a black hole as more of a property that happens of matter, of the idea of that when you get a certain because like the way they're going to actually look for this is because on the edge of, of the edge of black holes you get antimatter collisions, you get regular matter and antimatter collapse and give off gamma ray bursts. That's how they're going to look for it, and that's one of the ways we detect black holes is we look for the collisions of of normal matter and antimatter around a, a black hole. So uh, yeah, think of it as like, think of a black hole as a thing when you have anything of, of enough, anything that could be any sort of, uh, 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 any sort of property that has mass is able to collect together in a large enough space, you could get then a thing that basically folds onto itself and creates a singularity. So um, it right. wouldn't, it, I, it wouldn't be like that, a, not likely to be that because it, it would, we see the properties of antimatter around black holes. So, okay. No, um, 
And I'm if, uh, I mean, have we talked about antimatter on the show? Because I, I know that we all have very limited understandings of it. But, but as I remember from my high school physics or a little bit of college, basically at the creation of the universe could have gone either way. Uh, mm -hmm. All atoms could have been made mostly of protons or mostly of, is, was it electrons or either, either one charge or the other? But basically it was mm -hmm. a coin flip and the vast majority of the universe happened to come up tails instead of heads. And a lot of the, the particles that came up heads immediately collided with all the tails par particles. And so, um, so as a result, there's very, very little of antimatter out there, although it is possible that there are giant chunks of it out there, in which case it would be the most efficient and powerful source of energy in the entire universe. If, if, am, I, am I on track with that as I understand it, Andrew? Yeah, I think that was, yeah, that's the, you know, there was like that balance, but then, it, you know, we ended up on one side, you know, and you get that weird thing too that comes up, like the chirality of like certain proteins and stuff and other things where it just sort of went one way. And there's probably a very fundamental reason why that we're still trying to figure out. Um, but, uh, you know, antimatter is a very interesting thing because it's a thing that we're now, it was one of those things that was super, super, it was one of those theoretical, but then the idea, well, it's a, we know this thing's real, we've observed it in the laboratory, but it's not a practical thing. Now we're actually in the laboratory producing antimatter. And now there's even companies working on antimatter containment systems because it has advantages for like, if you want to produce super high energy, you know, uh, energy beams, things like this, they could actually be used for like cancer treatment, et cetera. And it sounds crazy that antimatter could be used for stuff like that, but it has this, you know, potentials for that. And so there's companies working on improving antimatter containment systems. And so an antimatter containment system would be some kind of vessel that uh, that is, there's a vacuum in there and there's a few, we're talking like <laughs> atoms, molecules, or I guess literal handful of atoms, but they're contained in like a, a superconductive um, uh, magnetic field, right? So they're sort of yep. balanced in the middle of nothing inside of a box. Yep, yep. Scientists will transport antimatter in a truck. New favorite headline. <laughs> <laughs> And it's it's a minuscule amount, but we're still learning how to produce it. And then it, you know it occurs naturally. It's one of the things that you know you, if you're looking for a far off space economy, is that you know on some of your your bigger gas giants and stuff like this, you know, as the sun basically blows off solar winds across the solar system, you get you get areas where antimatter collects. You know, there's antimatter in orbit around the Earth. There's certain belts and stuff where we have it too. Just not a lot of it. So, so. crazy. Yeah. Man, Spaces antimatter be upside down. What are they? They're antimatter? They're the Australia of matter. <laughs> Weird. And there were a lot of like fundamental questions about antimatter. We're pretty sure we have the answer to now. But even up until recently, wondered like, hey, does it uh, does gravity affect antimatter the way it affects you know what we consider regular baryonic matter? You know, and and we think like, like yeah, it does. But we had to still sort of build experiments to sort of test for that because you know we we can't make all these assumptions. So, cool. And it was a confusing plot point in Ad Astra. Oh, I, so so you did watch Ad Astra? Yeah, we talked about it before. Oh, okay, all right, all right. I, I didn't know. Yeah, if, yeah. Oh, that's right. It was Justin who hadn't seen it. That's right. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, gentlemen, um, do you want to jump into picks? Yeah, I got want... a weird. Oh, I, got, I got one more. Wait, I got. What's that? Oh, go ahead. So uh, Tesla pushed through an update, Tesla, uh, the latest, I think it's 10.0 software update. And uh, one of the features it has on there is Smart Summon, which I have a friend who's on the beta who's been able to use this. So Smart Summon is you can stand, you know, at the you know, stand out in front of a shopping mall, press a button, and your Tesla will back out of its parking space, slowly drive through the parking lot, and pull up in front of you, and you can hop in, which is oh great. Oh, my gosh. I'm already buckled in for all of the YouTube videos of, like, people <laughs> freak out when car drives itself. Well, there's that. And, yeah, a lot of times, like, people are using it in busy parking lots and stuff, and, and you're seeing videos uploaded of, you know, that's like, oh, oh no, Tesla. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> it definitely just drove into it's, it's a, no no worse than an old lady driving <laughs> yeah it, it, so we just watched a video of a tesla approaching towards somebody else in an intersection and then another car somebody just racing through the parking lot not really paying attention and deciding to stop so nobody got hurt but you know it's still 
we're going to see more videos of this as people are using their remote controlled cars in parking lots. I'll and tell you what, man, if, if I'm Elon Musk, I'm like as many of these videos as you want, post them, get them out there. Cause what I love about these videos is notice the lack of anybody being hurt, injured or dying. Uh, yeah. I mean, my feelings would be hurt if I used this feature and then somebody dented my Tesla because it drove into a... Uh, well, we saw a video. We have a video of somebody's Tesla backing up and some other car backing up into them. And it looks like it was the other car's fault. But, you know, how do you explain to your insurance company? Yeah, right? Is that covered? Yeah. yeah well, Here we see this truck. So, so here's the weird part is I can't decide if parking lots are the worst place to start instituting this due to the lack of set rules or the best place because everything is happening very, very slow and everybody yeah. is sort of negotiating. It, uh, parking lots are one of the few times of driving that nobody's really running on autopilot. It's one of the few times that drivers are fully engaged, scanning, looking for pedestrians, looking for children, looking for baby carriages, looking for other cars who are clueless. Uh, we None of us really have any respect for what lines are painted where. So maybe, maybe this is the right uh, trial by fire. So for those of you who are just listening, we're watching this video of a smart summit where the, the, the Tesla just keeps pulling out, but there's a, a truck that kind of uh, came up to it, and the Tesla keeps trying to give the truck an opportunity to go by, but then when the car, when the truck does it, it pulls out further as if it's going to go, but never goes, and so now it's just, <laughs> it's just back and to the left, back and to the left. <laughs> But that's all like in, in a world where machine learning is now able to give us, you know, deep fakes. I got to feel like they're going to be able to deep fake the way drivers sort of negotiate with. Oh, are you going? Am I going? Oh, you definitely are going right now. Yeah, they're there. It's like you had a situation here where you watched. This is a big truck like with dualies, whatever, that went to go turn a corner, which meant that basically it's driving. on. It's in the middle of the road. It's at both sides. Right. And so the Tesla's faced with this thing where it's thinking in a properly ordered world, this car would be on one side, not here. And now, and the, and the driver of the truck's like waiting for the car to go, even though he's, that situation where you're trying to pull in and somebody's blocking you because they don't realize how far over they are, which is a real situation that it has to prepare for. So um, you, the, <laughs> the beautiful thing is, is you get a ton of data from this. You're going to get a lot yeah. at Tesla. There's, there's people at Tesla that handle all of this sort of data of like, what went wrong here? What went wrong? How do we improve it? So expect a new software update in a couple of weeks that's going to learn from all of this. Yeah, but but even then, it's remarkable that it works even this this close to well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's awesome. You know. Hey, yeah. so I got my kids to watch war games over the weekend. Uh-huh. It was a lot of work. Uh, not so much to get them to sit down, but every five minutes to explain what a rotary phone is, what a modem is, <laughs> wh uh, what Russia what, is, yeah, what yeah, a the Cold bomb. War, to explain what the Cold War is, to explain the existential threat of thermonuclear annihilation, to what explain the chess game and the tipping point, and to explain how AI, uh, voice speaking AI independent sentient robots weren't a thing <laughs> back in in 1982 yeah. or whatever um I, I, they were polite and uh, ended but also unimpressed with the spectacle of the war room unterrified of the existential threat of nuclear annihilation uh it, it was really a bizarre wonderful experience uh they did relate to the golden retriever and the grossness of buttering your corn with bread when the dude spreads the the butter on his bread and then rolls the corn in it, no, that's, that's a, smart. That's I know smart, it is. It, it, it's it's a nice food hack. That's smart. Uh, how did it go compared to how you would have expected, Brian? Like, were you did you, did you go in thinking that something would play that didn't? I didn't. Very early on, I realized how little cachet um, war threats have 
to somebody who hadn't experienced the Cold War. These kids, they've, they've got no memory of it. It's got no bite. And we experienced the same thing when I showed my daughter the hunt for Red October. Like, she thought it was cool. I get, like, you know, she's like, oh, I guess there's a special sub. And the one group of nice people are trying to give it to the other group of nice people. And it's like, no, no. It looks like yeah. it, it, there, there's no understanding of brinksmanship or being poised at the edge of the universe. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating. And look, I'm not going to say that I wish we could go back to the Cold War, but it is fascinating and wonderful to see children growing up. Uh, and we saw the same thing in the James Bond franchise. I remember a couple of the worst Bond movies were right after the Soviet Union collapsed because it was like, so who are we afraid of now? And, and, we, and we're uh, drug dealers? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Arabs? Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it, it's, it's pretty wild to watch all of that change. Well, it, it, not only that, you had the James Bond movies were like, who are we afraid of now? Like, because the Russians are clearly our friends and will never be our enemies now. And then, uh, then you yeah. know, China, those wonderful people over there, poor people there, they'll never threat. And then like, oh, yeah, sex is bad. <laughs> like we're gonna have the monogamous James Bond, <laughs> and it was like no Russians, no sex. We're gonna dial back the drinking. It's like why have James Bond? Yeah, that's literally like like the the the, the father son and holy ghost of why we watch these movies. <laughs> Yeah, uh, in, in the chat room, JKing206 says, uh, you know, the kids grew up in a perpetual war and a nebulous enemy. Part of the problem with that is like, yeah, that means kind of no rules. Basically, you wait for lightning to strike. It's like being at war with a lightning storm. You could shake your fists and you could shout about how we will never stop being prepared for another lightning strike. And then it slaps and you're like, ah, and it's like, well, yeah, we'll you'll never get that place again. Well, yeah, because it's been an era of what has felt like a very secured war, right? Like there's, there's not the same threat that it felt like during, during the Cold War, right? Uh, well, and I think that's part of why we're seeing so much, this, this is way, I, I haven't really thought far? this through, so forgive me if I'm totally wrong about it, but I think that's part of why so much of our media cycle attention goes to the threat from within. Because when we hear the narrative of a crazy person who gets an AR-15 and shoots a bunch, bunch of people, we can hold on to that and understand, like, okay, that's, a, that's, that's an actor and an archetype that I can understand. And also, there's a thing I can do about that, whether it's, you know, in, depending on what belief you subscribe to, whether it's restricting guns, increasing licensing, increasing mental health education or whatever. So I, I think, um, man, there was nothing like that simplicity and again i'm not nostalgic for the actual cold war war but, used to be yeah. simple everybody but man <laughs> could you tell some simple stories back in the cold war days well, I, I think you part, know it, if, if we want to get into a a larger kind of meta discussion it's we are in a very introspective age and we are connecting to each other on an introspective kind of level with social media and, and even texts and phones and facetime and everything that if, if there is one fundamental shaping of it is that you're always able to say, oh, well, my feelings are X and I'm connecting with people who have similar feelings and experiences or differing. I'm, I'm attacking the people that I want to attack are the people that have different ideals on that. And it's not as simple as like, oh, OK, well, whether or not we agree with the government, we do understand that we are at odds with another government. And if they disagree enough we are all dead by way of nuclear holocaust yeah there, that and there's also like you know the, the reason nostalgia works is that if you lived through it then you know that period turned out to be okay even if you were you know could people like nostalgic towards the 50s which i don't know jim crow law stuff like that like and <laughs> it was well, really and, and horrible even, for uh, a lot of people Take a science fiction show like oh, man that miniseries and the following follow-up miniseries for v uh, that, that was almost a nostalgia play for what in the 1980s, most of the people watching it in their forties, uh, uh, in their mid forties were, were preteens and teenagers during world war II. And so as a result, seeing a bunch of aliens coming in, acting like they're friends with clearly Nazi inspired, uh, hierarchies and uh, uh, agendas uh, might've been a weird kind of nostalgia play. I wonder if maybe we're due for some version of Cold War nostalgia in a sci-fi format. I guess we got that with The Expanse. The Expanse was pretty much, you had the US and uh, as Earth, you had Russia as, as Mars, and then you had the third world as the belt. 
and and we continue yeah. to to enjoy that story. Uh, the Oscar, you ever notice the thing about the V logo? How it's like a swastika? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 part of a swastika and two dots on there. But of course, you know, when I was in second grade, I didn't know it about, about any. Well, of I knew because I listened to two guys next door talk about it, and they're like, ah, and you notice it's clearly a swastika, and I'm like. Hmm, interesting. The <laughs> bad guys from Raiders of the Lost R. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can see if you, if, oh, you had it there for a second there, Bryce. Uh, the, the symbol on their uniform is the one that looks uh, vaguely swastika-like. But, yeah. uh, man. And that was the, the TV series. They went, like, full-on World War II because they had, like, their Casablanca, like, middle ground kind of place where, you know, where both the aliens and the humans, you know, could, you know, interact and whatnot oh, man um, what man what a nostalgia bomb just even looking at that design that's i watched the hell out of those that was like it was the the, the most disappointing part of the, the the reboot that they did was that like you could have still taken that iconography and it would have played like, yeah. like so much really good like like there's like retro crap that you're like oh that's cool because i remember it as a baby and then there's some stuff where it's like man like if if a, a pop artist if Lady Gaga showed up looking like that, you'd be like, oh, dude, that's cold as hell. That's awesome. Yeah, the uh, man, there was a window where the rumor was that the reboot was not going to be a reboot, but just it's been 20 plus years and the same resistance fighters are beleaguered and broken and missing arms and eyes and they're still fighting the good fight and this has been their forever war. And I think there really would have been something to that. But uh, oh, well. You know, I, I wonder if they were to do it now, it would probably be that because now the appetite is so much more on the level of like, no, we want to directly plug into this other thing. We don't necessarily see the value of like there's, you know, the the, the difference between like the, the Ghostbusters, the Paul Feig Ghostbusters movie being like, no, we're going to totally reboot and turn over everything versus what you're going to see now coming up where it's like, no, we definitely it was a mistake to throw away all this lore and all this uh, 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 connection point. Uh, and I think that, that even in television, you would probably see that. You, you know, the, uh, the one thing that comes up, too, that's really sad about V, remember the character Robin who got pregnant, you know, with the alien baby? Spoiler. Uh, two, two babies. One lived, one did not. Yeah. The actress, do you know who was originally going to play her? Hmm. Dominic Dunn, the girl from Poltergeist who got murdered by her boyfriend. Oh, the, the, old, uh, the older teenage daughter. Yeah, yeah, that was tragically murdered. Um, and you know, I mean, I man, that po tragic, uh, poltergeist. What a tragic story, just in general, because the older daughter in poltergeist uh, was killed in that incident. She actually yeah, had a lot solid. of Hollywood heat at the time, and of course, the little girl Carol Ann. Um, I think she had a, a, a like a, either an autoimmune or liver disease or something. Yeah, they uh, misdiagnosed it while they were shooting like poltergeist two or three or whatever, and then yeah, it passed, and that that just, just sad. So. Yeah, and I, then you look at you know, like that's the thing too. It's like I watch V, and you I actually went back a few years ago and started watching some of the original ones. But and then you're like, you look in the cast stuff, and you're like, oh my god, like oh, you know, just uh, terrifying. They they also yeah. do on V because uh, pacing was just different uh, 40 years ago. They uh, they take a long time to get to the twist of that the aliens are bad guys. You spend an yeah. awful long time, and this is back before the internet, before everybody knew what a thing was, before it came out. Uh, you spend an awful long time, that whole first act, being hopeful, like, oh, this is great, it's a new... And then, and as a result, that twist really has some punch. And, and remember who played the good alien, Willie, who played him? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Robert England, uh, Freddy. That, that's how... He'll Freddy always Krueger. be Freddy, or he'll always be Willie to me. Yeah, <laughs> and so he's got played like... Freddy the, the super nice exception. Oh, yeah. and, and he was so adorably, you know, trying his best. Uh, oh, man, what a different character. Yep, yep. What about right. you guys, Picks? Oh, man. You know, I was at TwitchCon, so uh, I don't really have a a ton of... Uh... Oh, oh, here's here's a pick. I, I I don't even know where you guys could hear it now, but I was lucky enough to be on uh, a conservative talk radio this Friday, uh, thanks to Andrew Heaton, who was uh, a, a fill-in on 560 The Answer in Chicago. Uh, uh, he did uh, two hours worth of uh, of content, and and I was there. I was at a, uh, at a at a at a bar in San Diego, listening to myself, you know, air on you know 
Chicago conservative talk radio, which was pretty fun. But uh, uh, I would just go ahead and, and say my pick is Andrew Heaton's uh, The Political Orphanage. Very, very, very funny guy and uh, a show well worth, worth watching. Uh, behind the story, uh, behind the, the scene story on this, like uh, that slot that he was plugging in for is, is the, uh, the slot formerly ho- held by presidential candidate. I can never remember. Joe Walsh or John Walsh? Walsh. Joe Walsh. Joe, Joe Walsh. Walsh. And, so he, uh, and he... uh, 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 who, and, uh, who uh, apparently, uh, uh, I don't know. That that particular station um, really wants a red team, blue team kind of talk show person, you know, and uh, and of course that's not what Andrew does. So instead, uh, he came in with a very sideways angle. I look forward to hearing this. Uh, yeah, no, it was uh, very, very, very funny, and and uh, I you know got to do two segments, which is which is pretty cool. Groovy. I got a pick. So Go. I've been playing uh, here on twitch.tv slash night attack. Uh, I've been playing uh, a story game. Uh, I, w- I just finished up doing Final Fantasy IX a few weeks ago. And so I've been playing this new visual game or visual novel game called I, the Somnium Files. And uh, it's, it's really weird. So it's written by uh, the, the man who wrote uh, the Zero Escape series, if you know those video games. And it's a sort of murder mystery game where you are a sinker, uh, P-S-Y-N, uh, a sinker. And uh, you go into people's dreams and you use that as, oh, also you're a cop, you're a dream cop. And so you go into people's dreams and you try to pull out information. Uh, none of it's admissible, but you use it to help find more clues and stuff. Uh, and. Uh, so you are you are trying to solve this case of of this woman who you you are acquaintances with, uh, who was found dead and has her eyeball uh, missing, uh, and an ice pick stuck in in the uh, in in the um, socket. So uh, whose dreams are you invading? Uh, various people. Um, okay. m- ver- <laughs> They're like you name it, man. You got dreams. I'm gonna invade them. I'm yeah. the dream cop. So basically, it doesn't sound constitutional. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they have to. It's not like he's got a um, like a supernatural ability. They go to a machine. They just go to this big machine at the police station. Um, but yeah, so you, you, (laughs) (laughs) that sounds like a, a 42nd amendment, right? No dreams shall be invaded unless a writ is provided (laughs) specifically mentioning the dream or memory to be uncovered. (laughs) And, and so it's, it's this weird thing because the last, the last series, the zero escape series that this man had written were all like escape room games. So you were doing like puzzles and little logic things or word puzzles and whatever where here you were trying to solve these like you're trying to solve people's dreams basically and so that means that everything that you do is wrapped in dream logic which is very (laughs) difficult to feel satisfying with um and so like the one that we're looking at on screen there's there's this uh youtuber she's like this young youtuber lady it looks like she's dreaming in minecraft yeah basically but it's actually but the the world that she's dreaming is the alley where you guys were just got shot up at uh, an hour ago got it so it's like a dream version of so i got it Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's 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 really it's a weird one. Um, I, if you if you're interested, check it out. Twitch.tv slash Night Attack. We I've been playing it uh, on the weekends, but uh, it's 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 one of those. If if it continues the, the, down the path that it's going, and like his previous games, uh, it kind of leans on a lot of um, I don't know babble, psycho babble, psycho uh, uh, fake science. Uh, like uh, like in Star Trek, they called it techno babble, where it's like mm-hmm. uh, 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 get the inertial dampeners back online, right? And so it leans into like oh, you know the the Mandela effect and um, or the anthropic principle, and it you know it gives you a lot, it gives you some real world ideas and some real world thought experiments, and says what if what if some of this stuff was real? Uh, but now this time you're a cop instead of a supernatural alien guy. Um, he, he, yeah, what's up? He, Here's what I think about visual novels. This is my frame of mind on this. It's like 1902, and somebody's like, hey, you know that Edison thing where you can take photographs and put them in a sequence, you know, like of the train and the station? And like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And you're Bryce telling me, like, I think we could tell stories with that. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. I mean, if you want to Maybe. tell a story, why don't you just write it out on a typewriter? It seems like the long way yeah. to go around to yeah. take thousands oh, of yeah, photos. I'll bet you. Oh, 
Oh, is the train's named Ed? I guess. <laughs> I guess house. Get out of here. I see these. I watch these things grow, and I see them getting bigger. And I see like an Oculus, like one of the most expensive things on the Quest is like Tokyo Kronos, and it's like forty dollars, and it has amazing ratings. It has amazing ratings, and I feel like I'm like, ah, this cinema thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, uh, is, um, what? I, I do it. understand there, like there is, I think a healthy amount of skepticism towards the story in visual novel or, you know, anime adjacent games like I, this. I, I, well, what? I, my skepticism is wrong. Let me be very clear on that. <laughs> I mean, I think, and, 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 but what, what I do appreciate about, about this writer's works is that they, t the, all the issues that I have with the way anime and, and different Japanese games are written. Um, this sidesteps a lot of it. It really, it really, for for good or for ill, uh, throws you in just to everything. You you start yeah. immediately at the crime scene. You don't know who you are. You don't know that you can jump into people's dreams, um, and there's there it, there's some explanation for that instead of just kind of hammering over the same you know the the same details. Oh, we did a thing. We're gonna go do this next thing. We're doing the thing. We just did this thing. You know. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I I recommend it given the the playing that I've done. It's called I it's AI colon the Somnium Files. I like Ken from Chicago's comments. Visual novels are for people who like video game cutscenes. I love video <laughs> yes. game cutscenes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> turns out there's some of the uh, best parts of those games. Yep. <laughs> the only My thing I love favorite. more than the cutscenes are trailers for video games. Like I would I will yeah. watch five video game trailers before I play one video game. <laughs> I I'm like my one of my favorite games of all time was like the the Blade Runner PC game from like the 90s. Oh yeah. Which was a lot like it was you know more just revelatory and I think that like for me I'm not into anime and that's kind of thing why I haven't jumped on board this because it's just very anime storylines. Mm -hmm. If they came out with something that was in my wheelhouse, you know, and I think that will happen, I will probably if they get an you know an IP or something like that like I would love to watch like a you know Batman got like I looked at like Batman Gotham the the game or whatever I'm like or Arkham I'm like looks cool but I don't want to run around and play Batman I just want to solve puzzles and just be you know like that part you and know I, and, I think that's what people gravitated towards the Telltale games for because it mm -hmm. was worlds that they already loved and right. interesting yep. decisions that you don't get to spend a lot of time on mm -hmm. in the Walking Dead universe or in the Game of Thrones universe yeah. right and so yeah and that yeah. was. Yeah, and I hope somebody picks that up again because that was just, you know, I think the failure of Telltale wasn't because those were bad ways to tell those stories. It's just the business models of like they, their business was were probably. What's that? Their, their business was bad. They overextended themselves yeah. by yeah. way too much. So I'm I'm excited. I'm still like, hmm, what is this thing you kids are doing? But I I, I have a feeling of which side of history I'm on here. So. <laughs> I mean, the good news is eventually they'll find something that speaks to you. I mean, uh, we got to a place yeah. where. Captain America could speak to your granddad uh, in movie form, and and you know, it. it I, th I think we'll see the same thing. Yep. Uh, my pick is going to be the Good Place. I'm like the last one to get on board with this here. Um, and and, and I, like, let me tell you how I got to the Good Place. Uh, went back and with my girlfriend, we watched The Office. We went to the <laughs> first. I was hit by a train. Its name was Ed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> driven by brian that was weird uh i watched the office and loved it you know got through the whole things and you know aw awkward last season uh watch said oh let's watch something else like oh let's watch something from the people who made the office so we watched parks and rec and really enjoyed parks and rec and i think michael Schur is sort of the big showrunner there and we got through parks and rec and we're like well now what do we watch and i'm like ah oh, yeah i hear good things about the good place and i'm like wait that showrunner is Michael Schur from the from Parks and Rec, so we'll probably have a good consistent quality from one to the next. And so, we've been watching The Good Place now, and I've been uh, enjoying it. It's different, and it, you see the evolution of the storytelling style, and I like it because my problem when I first started watching The Good Place was I'm sort of waiting for things I think they're going to happen, and then I kind of went away from it. I went back like, oh, cool, they got to that point, good. Now they're going to go in some new direction, which I'm not sure where they're going to go, and this will be cool. And it's like, oh, this character and, and I think is this. To clarify, yeah. you're how far into it right now? Uh, almost into second season. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, exciting news. Not a spoiler. The best is still yet to come. It just gets better and better. And it's, We're out it's, of we just 
it, it's nice that the, the the season that they're doing airing right now, season four, is kind of a finale season where The Office and Parks and Rec both sort of suffered, not as much as other shows have, but sort of suffer from being like, how long can we make this show? Or at least the assumption oh, that oh, it's oh. like, well, obviously you have a hit show, so your job is to figure out how to go on forever. Get to 100. Uh, you know. Also, yeah. Michael Shore uh, was fairly demanding that uh, they do shorter seasons. I think that each season is like very cable or Netflix esque, like thirteen or fourteen episodes, uh, and and that was done on purpose to say like, hey, look, we want to churn story like really fast, which is unlike the the kind of strengths of doing a sitcom. Uh, although, like very plainly, this is kind of a workplace sitcom with just a very fascinating workplace. It works well because each season, the I don't want to spoil it, but I'll say that the dynamics change. You know, one of my favorite things ever was like the end of Battlestar Galactic. I forget which season. And at the last last part of that season finale is you get this one year later and we jump ahead one year later. Yeah. And then, so now with the story. You know. I think it might have even been like five years later or something rid ridiculous. Yeah. But but, but they're, right. they're, they did that a number of times. They did it where it's like, oh, there's another ship. I'm sure that ship will have to be sacrificed for a thing. But instead they subverted that and they're like, nope, we just have two ships now. And then it's like, well, here's a planet that almost works. And it's like, okay, well, I guess there's, they're going to find out the horrifying secret of the planet and why they have to keep on going. And they're like, nope, we're just going to set up a government on this planet. It's like, holy cow. Yep. Yeah, Ronald E. Moore was really good. There's certain shows you go... They just really get a stain ahead of the audience. Like Rick and Morty's fantastic about that. You know, just yeah, my and, favorite and example. I, I think I mentioned it last week. Uh, Infinity Train is as well in a similar way to uh, uh, Rick and Morty. Is it? Would you say it's written at the same level? Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of shared DNA. Uh, Infinity Train comes from the creator of Regular Show, so it's a guy who knows how to tell nested narratives that appeal to adults and kids uh the setup awfully similar to uh snowpiercer a uh, girl mm -hmm. with uh, 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 troubles at home finds herself on a magical train uh is working her way up to the front car where hopefully she'll see the face of god or whatever and uh, uh short episodes around 12 minutes each uh, i think there's what only 10 episodes in the season yeah it looks like uh that. there is a couple of moments like halfway through that just delighted me beyond words uh both in a positive and a uh, heart-wrenching kind of way. Um, I really look forward to what they do with it because it surprised that it gave that rarest and most wonderful gifts in video narrative storytelling in that it truly surprised me. That's delightful. I, I, I've i held off on that and some others because like the animation styles look like you can be simple but be stylistic. Like I like Rick, love Rick and Morty because Royland has a style that you mm -hmm. just go, this is so cool. And, and I see some of these things that, man, I'm like, man, they just feel like, so basic. It, it really does. It, it looks like what you would expect your six-year-old to be watching, and your six-year-old can watch it. But then, you know, yeah. if you go to it with an adult sensibility and, and a storyteller sensibility, you'll see yeah. that they're, they're really doing some clever stuff. Like, at some cool. point, there's a train car where we spend a, a good, you know, uh, three-quarters of the episode uh, seeing various versions of how she remembers the day her parents explained they were getting divorced. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this is heavier than I expected. I'll now. check that out. I'll check that out. Yeah. Well, it's like something I like, I like shows where the creators set themselves up to do something different. Like mm -hmm. each time, like try to you know surpass themselves. So I dig that. Cool. Well, I don't think we can surpass ourselves any more than we surpassed ourselves. Yeah. Thank you very much to all of our patrons. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yup. It's been weird. So weird. So weird. So there we go. There we, there we go. Go. Uh, all righty. Let's uh, take a short break. We're going to come back in just a minute. Okay. And I'm going to go put these in the kitchen. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Justin, how's it going, my man? Hey, man, what's shaking? Oh, you know, I, um, so I, uh, um, did I, I, don't, I don't know if I talked about this last week. Maybe I, um, maybe I did this and just didn't tell anybody. So I went to the Apple store last week because I was trying to look at my options with the new, what is it, iPhone 11 Pro? The new phone. New phone. And my, the black, the back glass of my screen is cracked. Or the, okay. the back, um, 
you know, where the back glass is cracked. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I've been looking, you know, all the upgrade thing, like my, the T-Mobile upgrade thing I have, you have to send in the phone. And when you go through the process, it's like, well, are, is the screen, the glass cracked? And you say, yes. And it's like, well, we can recycle it for free. We can throw it away <laughs> for you. So I went to the store and I was like, well, what would it cost to to just replace it or to repair it? Um, yeah. The T-Mobile thing I have has Apple Care Plus, so let's knock this out. Maybe see what this is. Yeah, yeah. And so it was, it it was only a hundred bucks. Um, the guy on the Apple Chat support app was like, it could be up to five hundred dollars, which is um, oh, not right. Because um, apparently they glue everything to the back of the glass of the phone, so uh, uh, uh. the screens are only like thirty dollars to replace, but. With this, the guy just gave me a new phone. He just opened up a box and like, here, you're just gonna have to put your show in the phone. And that was cool. That was certainly cool. Like get a kind of refreshed my battery, which is fine. I actually don't yeah. actually have battery problems. Um, you know, new display, you know, just, everything's new. Um, and, it, and I think it kind of made me like hold off on getting a new, getting the new phone. No, I mean, yeah, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into stuff like that, right? Like mm -hmm. you got to figure out, you know, how like what do you really want? Like, do you want longer battery? Do you want a like? Are you frustrated by the new operating system running slower on old hardware? Like, mm -hmm. I think that there's there's a lot of kind of vectors that sort of go into it that I've been able to bury within a deep part of my soul because I can write off buying an iPhone because right. I'm on Daily Tech News Show. So it's like. Uh, I think for, for the consumer, we're in a very commoditized world for smartphones. There's a lot of smartphones that do a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. On are the days where there, you know, is a proprietary element to something that is like out of the box, undeniable, amazing, right? Um, even stuff that, that was kind of like longer tail of value, like, you know, Apple's App Store is kind of, uh, you know, while there are certainly some security things, like in general, a lot of major apps, you know, there's there's either no gap as to when they launch on both platforms or a very small gap. Like it's not like two years of iPhone only Instagram before they come out with a a Android, Android. version, right? Um, um, and like, so yeah, it, it made me look at all that stuff because the big new thing is, you know, the process is faster and the cameras, you know, the new camera the I, front I, camera I, I, is I will say the camera the camera is the first time that i've ever screwed with the camera and been like oh my god this is like just fundamentally changes how i take pictures and videos like being able to like whereas before pinching and zooming uh you know to to get the uh, picture to look exactly the way you want made it was oh like it either looks a little hacky or a little like amateurish if it was a video. If you're like, oh my god, I'm gonna like zoom in, it, it looks a little home video-y, like yeah. when you actually watch the video. The fact that there's just three buttons that I can just go like boop, 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 and I'm just constantly like live switching to another really good in focus composed shot is uh, just kind of a game changer. Like I, I, I get why they made the aesthetic decision to have it look like a weird spider sure. Um, sure. for for that user experience. Yeah, but I, I think at the end of the day, and, and it's cool, I, I use it in the in the store a little bit. And yeah, changing the, the lenses uh, when you're taking video is cool because it's, it's it doesn't like snap as quick as it normally does. Like it kind of smooths, it kind of makes it look, look like a real transition. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, like I think it ended up just being a financial thing where you know, for T-Mobile, I'd have to put up, I'd have to pony up like 130 or something up front. Um, okay. Uh, or oh, just to clear out like whatever the old deal is, and now no, you have the new. No, just at, as the down, as the down payment. Oh, I, okay. Um, though the Apple with the Apple one, I, I was also looking at the Apple program, and and that's there's nothing is zero down, but it's a much higher monthly on that. They ended up being very close, but I think. I can at least wait a little while, um, and I'll see. Cause it it's you know it's still got the the phone I still have still has the same you know still has the screen it still has the 
it still has touch the touch the force touch thing which i i really like still and i'm not gonna like uh not having yeah uh here I, i'm back. yeah you you go ahead because brian, brian i the thing uh, you should try like uh, brian let's try the one without the force touch now because like it works the same for me yeah yeah, I mean, I, I think force. That's the reason they drop force touch is just because in software you're able to do the long press and the force touch effectively work the same way. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I think press just... instead of the force touch. Like the only thing I've used it for is to enable mouse wheel or mouse mode, basically. And and once I found out that you don't have to push, because I'm always afraid to push too hard and be messing up my screen. And then once I realized, oh, all I have to do is hold it down for a second. That's yeah. easier. Yeah, um, but I I, th I think this will be the first time. I don't I don't know that I've actually waited a, a, a year for the new phone. Are you gonna sit this one out? I think I'm gonna. Cause... That's the that's the recommendation from those you know who bought it, and it's only because mine's busted that I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, well, I'm gonna have to get it. But I mean, if you I mean if you have la I I mean every year I hear that though they're like oh, if you feel like it waited out and like I like I'm like yeah if your phone works fine for I talked to somebody at a party you know the other day who like had a iPhone like six and I'm like well if it works for you then keep it sure. you know yeah. I, I but I like I love the cam like the camera is my favorite feature I love the camera so if you're like for me with the upgrade program like well every year I spend five hundred dollars for a new camera I'm like yeah, yeah. it's cool yeah. that's fine but if you don't care about the camera then yeah. Um, um. And it also, with well, paying this phone off, then I can free and clear make the switch if I want to to the Apple upgrade. Phone. And also, everybody on this live stream has a pretty rock solid excuse as full time media professionals that we can justify yep. having good, good quality media production tools at our fingertips. Technology addict. Technology addict. Um, compulsive buyer. No constraints. Just. Im no, Im no, no impulse control. That's my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, you guys uh, want to do FTO? Yeah, I was thinking for a topic. Uh, I'll start off. I've got like I just made just like a list of like work life hacks, like things that I know that help increase my productivity. And I could start off with a few. And if you guys have some, then join in and or comment on that, whatever. So yeah, it's great. So grab bag, uh, tips, grab yeah, bag. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I put together a list, so it's like if you're, you give you guys a chance to think of stuff. Cool. All right, then uh, let's start After Things in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Adam Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. So I thought we'd do an episode where we talk about some of our personal work. Uh, I wrote like work life hacks. Number one, turn off autocorrect. Um, <laughs> work life hacks. And I, I've got a list of some stuff here. I'll, I'll point mine out. And then Brian and Justin will share. And there's Bryce as well. And first off, not, mileage may vary. The thing that's super great for me may not be super great for somebody else. The thing that I'm totally cool doing may not be. But I also think that... You know, when I look at people who are very, very productive, sometimes they have habits I do not have, and I probably should have those habits. Sometimes they have habits that I should not acquire. And so just take everything with, with a measured dose. But, you know, I'm, you know, for background is, I'm a guy that likes to work on projects that require a lot of focus and do them in a short amount of time. When I write a novel, I try to write my novels in weeks, not months. So I try to get these things done and that. And I think I would say it's worked out really well for me. You know, I've, I've had a pretty good run with writing novels so far. And so I've been very happy with that. And I think that my habits have helped that. So I'll talk about just a, a few of those. Number one, uh, no notifications. When I sit down at my Mac right here, there are no notifications. There is no iMessage. The only time I ever communicate is when I open up my email client and I don't get little whistles or any sounds when an email comes through or using Skype. There is no iMessage, there is no Facebook, there's nothing. My, my writing computer, which is also my main work computer, nothing will interfere with my time when I sit in front of it. And so what, that's my- What do you think is the right point in your career to embrace that kind of thing? Because I can totally see the benefit to that now with where I'm at 
and how established I am and, and where, where my time is most valuable. But when I think back to the very early days when I was just quitting my day job and every email was an opportunity to book a gig or whatever, I just have a really hard time to feeling like, uh, of feeling like back then that would have been a smart idea for me to engage in. I, it's a great point. And I would say that my, it all depends on how you make your money. Okay. I make my money by turning out a novel, right? By turning out, that's how I make my money. I don't make my money by picking up phone calls or booking shows and stuff. I, I have to check my email once or twice a day to make sure like I just in the middle of our show, my editor sent me the new cover design and I needed to say yes or no on the cover. Now I didn't have to do that right away. I could have waited, you know, I waited an hour to go respond to them after the show to respond that's my life as a, as a writer is that if I did, if I handled email in the morning and at night, probably there would be no impact on what I did. But for you, where you've got to do cust is when you're still in the position where you have to be doing the customer relations. Yeah. Customer relations, is your job, having people contact you is critical. And I think now you're in a point where you can say, Hey, Joe down the hall, you handle this for me. But that's a great example of, of the difference. And also it helps to, set boundaries like I, I i you know i'm not in a position too much where i sit down and i need to have my notifications off so i can focus on on this one thing but i do have my phone set up that at a certain time at night it turns on do not disturb uh, my slack is on do not disturb so people see that uh, i won't receive messages um just so that you know it, there's there are very few things that are going to happen after 12, 1, 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. that I that I need my if I'm awake that I need my phone to go off and say here's the Slack uh, panic serotonin you need to stop what you're doing and answer this message usually that stuff can wait until the morning. I, you know, Bryce, I was, I, when I worked for an organization and I realized that there was no respect for my time when I would get called, I did that because it was sort of like, I would want to sleep in on a Sunday morning. I'd be called with the most, the stupidest request possible. And so I made that decision of like, I, I turn off, I'd have to turn off my phone or my alarms until like 11 or whatever it was, because I realized I'm not a doctor, mm -hmm. you know, and I have no medical knowledge. There is no, no super dire emergency that there is not somebody better you can handle to get to handle it when you call 911. Yeah, you so. know what? There is something that at one point in my life, nothing made me more angry at. And now I see as a tactical strategy might be one of the smartest things to do. Uh, my friend, Nate Staniforth, when I call him and he does not answer, he says, hey, it's Nate, leave a message. And then you hear a beep followed by the words, the user is has no room on its voicemail. Goodbye. <laughs> and that might be the most brilliant thing because he now knows that I called him. And when he looks at his missed calls, he'll see, oh, Brian called. And he knows that if it's important, I likely will call more than once. Almost the content of the message is, is pointless. And uh, I don't know, that, that might be a hack worth at least trying on. Go ahead and fill up your email, uh, your voicemail box, see what happens. Yeah, I don't get many. I mean, I, I I will call, and if I don't get somebody's voicemail, I just send them a text message because yeah. I know it's easier to read a text message than to go through a stupid voicemail system. Mm -hmm. So certainly a version of that. Um, oh, well, my next one is, uh, but also the advantage of no notifications is your attention is your own. You, your your attention cannot be pulled away from anything else and everything else. So yeah, just you know, away. Yeah, I I found that a little bit like as I've had a few projects that have required me to just dial in a little bit more and specifically when I'm like in the frame of mind where I'm not doing something that I've done a million times or I'm trying to reform my process. I'm trying to be a little bit more deliberate about my process and not just kind of make all the same decisions that I normally make uh, where when I'm frustrated with the res with, with the results of that of that decision, I tend to want to medicate with distraction with Twitter or whatever. Right. Um, and so like, it's, it's one thing if I'm like, just like, all right, if I only have to fight one front and it's just this desktop and I'm just looking at that, then it's like, yes, I do have to exercise the self-control that I'm not going to open up a web page and then go to check something out. Right. Um, but more and more I've found that I just need to not only leave 
my phone in the other room, mm -hmm. but I also need to like put my watch on, uh, you know, or I need to put both of them on airplane mode. So at the very least, I'm at least only fighting just the desktop, like just me wandering off, you know, or getting lost in a Wikipedia hole in like research or something like that, just in this place and not, I'm doing that, and then I get the thing on my phone, and then I'm paying attention to the thing on my phone, and then I come back to the thing, and now I'm just watching a video, and blah, 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 blah. Like, that that has been something that I've learned more and more as I've gotten into projects that aren't just, like, here, dialed in, we're talking, we're having, you know, a good time, the connection is part of the reason why the show is good. Uh, uh, but if it's just me building art by myself alone, there are like safeguards I need to put in to prevent myself mm. from sabotaging that. W one I, thing, and, oh, don't no, go ahead. No, please, first. Uh, one thing that helps me when I do need to get in that is I have at home where I do my editing, I have two monitors set up. And um, the way that I have it set up is that the one monitor, the big monitor, is the editing thing. And then the side monitor is just Discord or it's, you know, some extra thing. I found just turning off the extra monitor. Um, helps keep me focused a little bit. So if Discord is open, if it's not open, it, you know, if I if I try to load up a Google Chrome thing, that just that on an empty or or preoccupied monitor being off helps. Uh, uh, if that's gone away, the other thing I do is um, on something that I know I'm working on today. I will. Uh, I have a. I have whiteboards. I, I have a couple of whiteboards, and I'll just write out. Okay, this. I need to do this step. 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 Um, and you just either just put it on the desk or just keep it right where I can see it, so I can wipe off thing after thing after thing after thing, um, so that you have it in in scope. That really helped me out last week, where I was like, well, it's kind of late at night. I have a couple of, but I could see I only had two or three steps left to, to go. And so I knocked those things out before the end of the night. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about how I use notebooks in a second to that effect too, because I think there's value there. But so my, my, my opinion is, I think if you want to sit down and you want to do interact on Twitter or whatever, it's great. I do that. And you can, you can have like, and I think that's perfectly valid to say, man, I'm sick of working for right now. I want to take a break and do that thing. And you just call it what it is. You just, you just yeah. say, yeah, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to spend a half an hour on Twitter formally calling what it is is just it, it one it helps you one get over like oh should i be doing this? like yeah no i need to relax i need to not be focused on this thing because it will drive you nuts i take breaks all the time I'll, I'll nap in the middle of writing a book i'll just lay down because my brain hurts or whatever so totally valid you know i don't think you should just sit there for 12 hours non-stop doing a thing i think you just want to be aware of where your time is and what you're doing because then you become more effective um to that point Notifications for me, like they are a little portal to, they're a hell mouth. Like if, if I could get, if anything can pop up on Twitter in front of me, it means that somebody could send me anything which could suck me in there. So that's one reason I don't use it. And it's, it's why I don't Facebook, you know, I just don't do Facebook and I miss out. I'm sure I've missed out on opportunities because I'm not on Facebook, but man, the personal time and what I'm able to do without it has been great. There's, there's other very legitimate reasons to be excited about not being on Facebook. <laughs> I, I increasingly do not regret my, uh, my resignation from that platform. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I, I feel like, like, cause one, a thing that I think about now too, is like, I'll go to like a couple Reddit forums or stuff that I like topics. I like technology and stuff. And now I have to think twice before I even comment on something because somebody may ask a question and it may be the most innocuous thing. But if I give them an answer that they don't like or whatever and they respond, it's getting over that urge to have to reply back and then waiting, waiting to see if they responded. That that waiting for, and that's why I don't do Facebook is the idea of like, oh, did somebody comment on this? Oh, now I got to go comment on that comment. And then it's like, holy crap, I just lost two hours today and I have anxiety and the bulk of it was spent like that monkey wired up to the cocaine button, just hitting it for the random reinforcement. Yep. And you don't even get cocaine. You got in a fight with somebody. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not like at the end they say, you have done it, sir. You've changed my mind. No, it's never that. <laughs> I've, lost, yeah. I've lost a lot of working hours doing that exact thing. And it, 
I'm not cursing on the show, but, yeah, wait, wait, but, but, but this is, this is, you know, we've talked about it before. Like I'm increasingly seduced by the idea of, of a blue pill opportunity where it's like, let me shape a reality where I don't even have to see that stuff. I, I feel like I would be more productive and get more done. So, uh, one of the ways that I try to be productive is I spend a lot of time with notebooks. You know, these are my favorite ones right now. These are these, I get these on Amazon, they're little journals. And I use them for writing books. I use them for writing code. I use them for stuff because, and this is odd, oddly enough, I learned, I appreciated notebooks because of my failure, failures at Photoshop. I remember when I tried to do Photoshop early on, I didn't appreciate the fact that Photoshop is really a compositional program, meaning you need to take elements from elsewhere. You don't open up Photoshop and be like, I'm going to create a poster out of, I don't know what, you know, you want to start somewhere with a sketch. You want to start somewhere else with an outline. And the same comes to writing a story. If I open up Microsoft Word, which I don't use, but I open up Scrivener and I'm like, oh, I'm going to write a novel right now with no other preparation. It could happen, but it won't happen as well as if I sit down and I make some notes and I scratch things out and I redo stuff. And man, still nothing beats paper for that. Mm -hmm. So I I found, uh, especially if you are at a job in an office or where you're out of the house a lot, that help that that helps. Like I would use a moleskin at my last job, which was an office job, and had me kind of going around uh, just to write down reminders or take notes of meetings or whatever. Um, and just that form something about the size of those medium moleskins is is really nice you know i i do enjoy, i find it much easier to write with pen than to type stuff out i'm sure i might be what? faster typing stuff out but writing it down i see it i know it's there it's like a muscle memory. the other thing that happens is that you don't re if you have an idea and you type it out uh, the same thing that's good is bad the thing that's good is that it's fast the side effect of that is that you don't retain it um you know studies have shown that even if you're not actually writing even if you're just miming the action of writing out notes then your brain will retain the information better and when it comes to putting together a story if what you have is a great a compositional element or a weird twist or whatever, like the fact of taking the time to write by hand uh, not only gives you a physical artifact, but also cements it in your mind. And you don't get stuck into the digital hurdles, right? If you want to draw, if you want to write two things and write, make a line between the two of them on a, with a pen, you just do that. And if you're in the notes app, it's like, well, now do, how do, what do I do? Do I mark do I it up? Yeah, there, make a screen cap? Do there, I, what do I do with that? There are there have been a lot of attempts to try to make that better and and I've been looking at like the remarkable board whatever sort of thing looking at that and I've played with different like the boogie board was kind of cool played with the version we're still not there sorry yet. what and, what are all of these are these whiteboards or well remarkable is as a tablet that's designed to feel like paper and it feels it, it's it's much more responsive than uh, it's an e ink display you touch it so the remarkable is a is sort of a, a step towards there. Basically, so it feels like this is a big paper tablet you can draw on it, and it's like I have an iPad Pro. It still feels like I'm writing on a glassy, futuristic thing. I don't treat it like I would a notebook. Right. Um, Boogie Board was a low cost sort of one too that could do this. Uh, and now we got well, this is the Goody Reader, so this is another one. I'll look up, look up into that. So they're really neat, but they're still not quite there yet. And I would love for if you want to talk a bit about Brian about you know whiteboards. Yeah, uh, I love whiteboards. Uh, the only bummer is that everything is ephemeral, but that also means that you have to, you have that moment of creation that you could do whatever you want and you put it out there, but then you also have that moment of deletion and you know you're deleting it. Maybe you could take a photo of it or whatever, but at the very least, what you're really doing is deciding, okay, I figured out what my tasks are. Now it's time, because I need the real estate, to figure out a new place to put this on my list, whether it's put things on your calendar, whether it's uh, write down the goal, whether it's um, uh, condense all of this, uh, this, I, this, this plan that you have and then reduce it to a single line on the new whiteboard 2.0. But I think that 
being able to take those in the moment ideas and get them out. Uh, first thing I did when we put up the whiteboard here is sort of come up with a, a statement of purpose and a, a grand scheme of how we're gonna create here at the new Modern Rogue World headquarters. And then what, there came a time where it's like, okay, I've got it, I've internalized all this. I could do all this from memory. So I came time to erase it. Now it's a matter of, as I'm walking around, you just see all the little things. I'm making a shopping list. Like, okay, we need something to protect the floors from the rolly chairs. We need uh, monitors over here. We need a mini split uh, air conditioner for this room because it's insufficiently covered. And it, it is so great to have that thought, be able to take action in that moment and know that it's not a solution, but it puts a pin in it so that near term future you can do it and get the satisfaction of wiping that off the board. You know what I have seen in every behind the scenes of Google, uh, I think Apple, SpaceX, and every production office I ever go to that produces a ton of stuff, wall, whiteboard, wall, whiteboards or whiteboard walls. Every It is a universal creative tool, even in the most technologically advanced companies, the whiteboard. And now I'm thinking about like, man, like maybe I want to do more whiteboard. You know, like maybe my background should be a whiteboard because, you know, Justin just made it hold a on, sign. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Did and Justin join the whiteboard did he just train? Quit the show. Oh, did he just quit the show? What? Well, Wait. And, and on that same note, I have uh, a portable. Oh, oh somebody got a, a whiteboard! Wow. <laughs> it's like human sized. It's big. You got a big one. Now, our guest host, whiteboard. <laughs> whiteboard so, city. Uh, you know, one of the things that I did recently was to. Um, you know, make a decision on on clearing out stickers or DIAF, which was like the merchandise store that I was running. And uh, part of it was like, I just had this realization that I have this whole wall where I have a bunch of stickers that are just kind of static, but it's right next to my studio. It's right next to where I produce everything that I do. And what I really need, if I'm gonna commit to doing more content is create a tool that will help me make more content. And so this board is literally today going up where the old shelves were. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Wow. Well, and I think you bring up a good point. We've talked before about how one of my suggestions is once you write down your goals, laminate them and put them in the shower because you take advantage of those idle thought cycles when you're not really thinking about anything and your brain is kind of nudged to think about your long-term goals. That in your workspace seems to be what happens with the whiteboard as well, where it's like, you're like, ah, oh, what am I gonna do? Oh wait, here's a list of things that passed me seem to feel like we're important. Let me, let me dedicate some bandwidth to those. That's why I have a laminated poster of Miss Maxim 2007 in my shower. <laughs> um, I have a, and, and my, I have a little portable, just a little, I don't know, a couple of, couple feet big, but I have a portable one so I can move it around and put it on. Doesn't count. Not what? as big as Justin's. <laughs> oh, oh, damn. Thanks for playing, Bryce. <laughs> but it's. It's nice because I can make it intrusive, right? If I go out on a, if I take a break, if I go and take a walk, I know I can write out my stuff and put it right in front of my desk so I can't ignore it. I know I can just put it where it's going to be in the way. So. Yeah. I'm, now I'm like Jones and I go on Amazon and look for whiteboards. <laughs> yeah. See, this is not about you guys. It's about me picking up these tools uh, from everybody by else. By the way, do yourself a favor. Get a magnetic whiteboard as well because you got those little mm -hmm. those little push pins that are just magnets that you're oh. able to put note cards on there. Then you're able to you know physically move stuff from one to the other. Uh, oh, that's what I got. And I could you know do a mental slate magic trick with them too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. Uh, we just had an intruder come in the studio. I have to go welcome. Uh, the original Brito, who just walked in. I'll be right back, I swear. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you another one of my work-life hacks is, it was funny, we would watch Brian leave and walk behind Bryce, and now we're watching a hug. This is now endearing. Will Harris, uh, the, the, the OG Brito, uh, uh, yeah, making his way to the Seven Acre Schwood in the Diamond Club. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, we've got to put some blinds on those doors. That was awkward <laughs> hugging there. Um, it was very, very, very sincere, though. One of my favorite things is I love to learn things, maybe to a fault, but I always I think that that habit I got into because there is such a wonderful amount of stuff online from YouTube courses, Udemy, and all this sort of stuff that uh, it is. And and again, I I'm more code centric in the things I've been learning to do, but I would say that you know part of like I got my Discovery Channel special because. I had been doing some courses on, you know, some AI and some tech stuff that helped me when I did my presentations that made it more convincing. 
there is all these specials like Udemy is great. They do these frequent specials where the two hundred dollar courses go down to thirteen. Like there was like we just saw a thing there for thirteen bucks, you can pick up an iOS development course, which is and she that Angela Yu at the bottom. Like uh, I don't know which course that is there, but uh, you her doing that's her web development. She's a great teacher. Does a ton of good courses, but like for the price of a supersized McDonald's meal, you can take a course that is better than most college courses, you know, more comprehensive than most college courses on these subjects. And you can make yourself, uh, uh, you know, commercially viable, create stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. I cannot emphasize how much, how important this is. And the other part of my last hack here is learn tools, like maybe intimidated by Photoshop or other things like this, pick up a course, learn, learn enough to be dangerous. And it's amazing. I, I I swear I don't have an agenda to make all of our programs uh, railing against college, but Justin and I have been on a tear <laughs> lately. Like this is part of the reason in this universe, anything you want to know, it's there for yeah. for practically for free. It's and, amazing. And if you are in a field yeah. where your work speaks for you, then these are a very good alternative, especially if you are, uh, you know, able to learn by yourself, able to reach out to people and get critiques on design stuff, you know, uh, if you are a filmmaker, you don't have to necessarily go to film school if you go out and make a lot of great stuff. If you are a web designer, you don't have to necessarily go to school for you know, graphic design or uh, web, web development if you make websites and they're good and you know what you're talking about. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, what's interesting is you said make great stuff. I didn't even know that making great stuff is as important as making complete stuff like well, that's I mean, in the terms weird of part like getting yeah. work yeah yeah oh sure 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 you know, at the end in. of the day you gotta you have to yeah. get good and that's the ultimately the goal but but yeah you're gonna start off being bad for a very long time when when i look to hire somebody or collaborate with somebody the the resume means very very little to me it, the resume because i've met so many comp the, some of the most incompetent people i've met have amazing resumes and i realize that because they moved around a lot um but uh, or they're just the resume seekers. And the the question I like was and I heard it was really, I think, poignantly put forth by somebody who was like a recruiter for SpaceX said that, you know, our favorite question to ask people is what have you made? And that's the best question. If I'm talking to a graphic designer, it's show me your covers. You know, if I'm talking to somebody who I want to work on a business project, like show me your past businesses. You know, if, if, if they all ended up bankruptcy, I'm not going to necessarily hold that against you, but let me know yeah. operationally what things worked, what they did. I want to know what your experience was, you know, and what have you made? What have you made? What have you made? Gentlemen, what have any of you made? Uh, <laughs> nothing. I'll tell you what, I made my yeah. decision on what my pick will be. Are we on to picks yet? Sure. Uh, I started listening to the uh, one of the last projects of the late great Stan Lee. I'm I'm listening to the audio presentation of A Trick of Light. I I believe that the print version isn't even out yet, but uh, it was a collaboration where they were coming up with uh, what would a new universe with Stan Lee's sensibility of taking adolescents who are struggling to fit in with the world as it is today and, and give them new types of uh, unique gifts. And uh, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's uh, surprising me uh, on and on again. It's come up with them. Um, this uh, is superhero uh, fiction? Well, yeah. I, okay. I mean, it's Stanley, so of course it is. So I, I don't think it I'm- just, It sounded I, like it might be like a documentary thing. No, 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 no. Jesus it's, Christ, superhero fiction. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, um, so uh, without uh, trying to be the least amount of spoilery, uh, there's a character that his opening scene is he's live streaming himself uh, on YouTube, hoping to, in thinking about, you know, shaking his fist at, let's say, the, the Flash Thompson equivalent who has hundreds of thousands of followers on his YouTube channel. This guy's got 16. And then something extraordinary happens live on the air. And, uh, and, and it's a Stan Lee story, so guess what? Maybe he gets a, a unique gets talent swatted. or gift. <laughs> and um, uh, yes. it's, it's fun what they're playing with. And uh, there are characters that it's like, okay, they're changing the name, but they're obviously talking about this specific person and uh, this particular network. Uh, I don't know. I'm digging it. Hmm. I'm about halfway through it right now. That's cool. Cool. Uh, hey, I have a pick. And it is rare because I don't normally pick video games, but I'm going to pick a video game. It is one that has swept through my household 
It is uh, uh, nothing short of a phenomenon. And Even mom- the birds are playing it. Uh, quite literally, Andrew. It is the Untitled Goose Game. Uh, oh, yeah. Which has now <laughs> become, uh, it is PC or Mac. It is, uh, I am playing it on the Nintendo Switch. But, uh, man, it is just one of those, like, ideas where, like, the mechanics wrap kind of so perfectly with the uh, uh, with with the, the 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 gameplay, it is essentially just a puzzle game where you are kind of ignored by most everybody until you start interacting with them. But you just play a horrible goose uh, around. <laughs> you, a, wait, wait, what do you get points for for harassing people or distracting it, them the longest? It, it gives you a long, it gives you a list of things to do to harass people. Yeah, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So like basically it's like the, the, so the puzzle will be it'll be like make the farmer wear his sun hat like that's all you get and then you have to realize that if you startle the farmer at a certain point and then steal his hat and run off with it he'll eventually go put on his sun hat uh so yeah you just you're just an a-hole goose uh running around and just ruining people's lives but you can honk at people and they get scared and run away or they chase after you there's no death. There's no violence. There, I, I, there's really no points. You literally just complete the game uh, as you go about. But it's, it's there's something just deeply primal and fun to it. And so I think it is it is something that has gotten the kind of attention that it has gotten for a reason. Oh, that's fantastic. It reminds me a little bit of the Stanley Bully. Parable. Yeah. It actually reminds me a little bit of the Stanley Parable in that you are... The, the goose is basically video gamers as people who play games right and what do they tend to do they want to go into a place and see what they can mess up whether that's the design of the place or not um and so it's interesting that this is a very sort of contained sandbox designed for this right designed to go and make trouble uh it's very cool it's it's short if you play just the main sort of route of everything it's probably like two or three hours okay so pc mac and nintendo switch so not not on mobile yet no, um, it's it, it's not. But it's like fifteen dollars maybe, um, and there's a bunch of extra stuff to do once you get it. I think uh, not a lot of story either, but uh, one of the best sort of beginning and ends uh, of a game uh, lately. It's very a very fun little thing. Uh, yeah, there's there's a reason why I think it, it has become social coup. To which my favorite tweet was just. Uh, the, the the Twitter text just said, "Uh oh," and it was just a picture of the goose right in front of the master sword from Zelda. <laughs> like, it's just there's just something about it being representative right now of just chaos. Like, put this thing anywhere, and chaos will reign. It is it is very enjoyable. Uh, I've also got a video game pick. Uh, this is on the Apple Arcade, but it also looks like it's on coming to Steam next year, maybe. Um, it's called Mini Motorways. Uh, this is from the people who made Mini Metro uh, many years ago, um, but it's it's this cool sort of I don't know puzzle game where you are in um, a city, so you like you can have the geography of Los Angeles or Tokyo or um, uh, Beijing, I think, and it just randomly pops up houses and buildings, and so you have to create roadways uh, between between these different colored um, spots. Do, do you end up, because of the nature of the topography, accidentally creating systems very similar to the ones that exist in these cities, or? Um, probably, I don't I don't actually know if, if it's like generating stuff influenced by the cities or if those are just um, geographical starting points. Hmm. Um, and be, I think the randomness does make it kind of tough in terms of um, strategizing. Uh, but it's 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 really neat. I've definitely spent a lot more time than I thought I would on it because it's kind of difficult to get into a good rhythm with it. Um, there's also not a lot in terms of like achievements or challenges. Like the game, the the Apple Game Center um, achievement is just like hit a base score on each of the different cities, and it's not. I don't think it's that difficult of a score, but I would like to see and play and try to play longer and longer and longer. Uh, because you'll you you'll your gameplay will end if any building doesn't get it has too many uh, needs 
more cars than it gets after a certain set amount of time. And, and I know you're two or three weeks into it now, but at this point, is it safe to say, like, I'm a bad person for not having subscribed to the Apple Games I think subscription? If you, I think if you like playing games on your phone. Well, and, and if you have three daughters. Oh, yeah, that, they'll love it. That, that they'll find probably the worst person, probably the worst person ever. I mean, if I'm on a game platform, Brian, and you're not. Oh. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's certainly one worth checking out. Mini Motorways. All right, I'm subscribing right now. <laughs> this is my favorite new segment of After Things, where uh, Andrew uh, makes a point and Brian immediately spends money. Like, this is now, we're now two weeks in a row. Andrew, do you have a thing? You know the thing about jet sharing, you know. So. <laughs> is there room for a runway at Seven Schwood? <laughs> seven acres wood. Sorry. No, is there a room like, like hey, we're, yeah, helipad or go home? Come on. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So uh, I, I saved this pick for after things because, like, I, I wanted a smaller group of people to uh, hear this than my the. Uh, listen. Um, <laughs> we all have things that we're not necessarily proud of, but you're like, oh, you ever, you, you know, maybe you might like this too. It's like, if I'm at a nice party, I'm not going to talk about like, oh, I love Arby's and Taco Bell. But, you know, you one on one, I'm like, yeah, like, oh, yeah, that fast food, like, yeah, Arby's, Taco Bell. Oh, yeah, I love that too. Oh, cool. Don't, don't tell those other people there because they will judge me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I subscribe to BritBox, which don't judge me. <clears throat> Particularly so, <laughs> I can watch like all the old school Doctor Who episodes. Mm -hmm. So like, I've been like watching like really like pre Tom Baker and stuff there, and uh, they are not good. <laughs> but <laughs> while I do something like I have this like there's shows that I watch and I just want to watch and there's shows that I'll do watch in the background and I don't you know good shows are people like. I will not watch in the background because I don't want to miss out. But I've been doing that. I've been watching like the uh, old school sort of Doctor Who stuff and all that. And it's kind of interesting, too, because it is this interesting time capsule from a time before I was born. And, you know, the, the different sort of phases of that. So, I mean, as a kid, I grew up like watching like Tom Baker and I loved him. But then I'm like, oh, maybe I should, you know, go back and watch the early ones. So I actually watched like the 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 old started from the very beginning and I've been working my way through. Um, and so I'm now in the John Pertree phase, which was sort of interesting because uh, I think it, it's his character is this sort of like kind of dandy type character. And he does this Kung Fu, which is, it's, it's, hey, yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. So uh, anyhow, that's my sort of pick. So um, do they, Box, how much of the catalog of Doctor Who do they have? Because I'm trying, I'm trying to find, it and it looks like they have some specials, but I don't. Uh, uh, they go up to like, uh, like Sylvester McCoy, you know. So it's they because they, they remember they brought back Doctor Who ended in 1989, then they brought it back. And they tried to do like the, the Sif Fox tried to do a version of it in like '96, and then Doctor Who effectively on like British British Doctor Who went away for like. 25 years oh, right wow. and then we got came back with christopher eccleston so you know this was a show that started back in 1963 um so it goes back from like the william hartnell and you get the trofton the Pertree, the tom baker davison all that stuff so you know and the and i remember like there was the fake this guy like that looks like tom baker but he's not like tom baker but it's got a name of him was colin baker and that so hmm. anyhow they call it you classic go. doctor who on here not just yeah. Doctor Who. So that's my pick. Uh, you know, I, I want to find out too, because like the this character, like the the John Pertree version of him, is he feels like a bit like almost sort of a Roger Moore character. I'm like, could it? I like, couldn't have been from the James Bond because Roger Moore's James Bond didn't start start till after that. But I'm looking back, like Roger Moore was doing the Saint, and I'm just sort of wondered if sort of he's sort of trying to be a Roger Moore esque character. I don't know, but anyhow. There you go, folks. Just bared it all out there for you. There we go. <laughs> so he's, courageous. He's British soul. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's been after. Hey, there we go. All right, everybody. Well, that's going to do it for us here for uh, Weird Things and After Things today. We'll be back in a few hours with Cord Killers. 
coming up here. Uh, Justin, any streams coming up today? Uh, no. Uh, no, just record more stuff. Mort Merrick's next stop podcaster. Nice. Uh, Andrew, still still typing I'm, away? I am going <laughs> to... Well, I found out that the book that I thought I had to turn in uh, tomorrow, I have another six months to do because... Uh, <laughs> uh, my my publisher said, "Oh no, we changed the because pu- I've we changed the publishing calendar." I'm like, "Next time, tell the author who's been panicking." Uh, I mean, uh, look, admit it, admit it. You're glad you got the work done, and you're glad you don't have to worry about it for a while. Oh, I didn't get anything done, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, no, I I needed. The, yeah, I I'm glad I have the relief, but uh, I have a new book coming out in uh, just a couple weeks, and that is the dark pattern and so i'll be probably doing a lot of live streaming and stuff talking about that i'm super excited about dark pattern so sweet it's very dark oh. very dark is it pattern maybe maybe you want to spoil it oh, so. oops. Oh, excuse me all right well we'll be back here with all right. uh, love you guys bye y'all bye. Bye.